Okay, real quick, I want to uh, review the context. Remember, this is uh, Children Matter, an unexpected message on church discipline, part two. Uh, quick review of our context, because chapter 18 has a bunch of ideas and verses that many of us are familiar with, but the chances are that if you're like me, that most of your life you've been uh, thinking about these verses outside of their context. So we're going to go back yet again to lay the groundwork for chapter 18. <coughs> most people um, want to live a life that matters, that has meaning. I was uh, reading an atheist website this week where they said that uh, life doesn't have to have meaning and don't pretend like it does because you're playing, a, you're playing the Christian game when you try to argue that life has meaning. So they were, they were very passionate and meaningful about trying to explain why life doesn't have meaning. Um, but most people, intuitively, you don't have to be a Christian, most people just want to live a life that matters, right? We want to have a life that means something. And that's a noble ambition. And uh, Jesus is like a good parent. He's always looking for a teachable moment. You know, the things that come in and instead of saying, oh no, where did this come from? Say, okay, let's use this to, to teach. Uh, and he's going to share with the disciples what type of life does God value? Now, does anybody in here care what type of life that God values? Because we all know what type of life we value. And the type of life you value is more than likely the kind of life you're living because we do the things that we think are important. We do the things that we, that we uh, place value in. But what does God see as a valuable life? Uh, because of our sin, no, sin nature, though, we don't have just a noble ambition to leave a good life. We have ignoble ambitions that uh, war within us. And that's what we see in the disciples, these disciples, these great men of God, right? They come to Jesus, and they want to know what they need to do to be the greatest. Isn't that funny? <coughs> and... This, then, is what Jesus uses as a teachable moment. He gathers together this inner core of believers, along with some others that were around him, and he, and he calls a young child over to him. So, so people, the disciples come, how can we be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus says, okay, let's have this little child stand in the center here. And in answer to the question, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, Jesus shockingly answers, truly I say to you. Now, why does Jesus say truly I say to you? I'm pretty sure we already trust what Jesus says. Probably the disciples did. But he's, he's emphasizing there's a different way. You guys think this way? Truly I say to you, you guys are all crazy. Uh, truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Did you see that? They asked, how can I be greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus says, forget about being great in the kingdom of heaven you won't be even allowed into the kingdom of heaven unless you're converted to God's way and become like a child. Over the last couple of weeks, we've pointed out that Jesus isn't saying, you know, what does a child do? They're noisy when they're not supposed to do, be. They throw fits in restaurants. Uh, they pout. They complain. They're really good at saying, that's my toy. I'm pretty sure that's not what Jesus meant. If you want to try to put together a theological argument why you think that's what Jesus is saying, you're welcome to do that, and we'll compare notes. Uh, I've heard people say that's what Jesus was saying. I don't think they're putting much effort into it. I think they're just looking for a reason to be critical of Jesus Christ. God expects his children, listen, to understand their need. A little baby, a little child, you know, when they're getting a little older and they still need their diaper changed, they know they need their diaper changed. They're not going to be able to do that themselves. When they, they, when they need a, a hot bottle, they run to dad. When they need to be nursed, they run to mom. Uh, little kids understand naturally their need. And it's not a big pride issue for them. Like, I'm, I'm going to be able to change my own diapers. When they get older, then they want to do that, right? But I'm talking about the little guys. 
they naturally understand their need. They need mom and dad because, and that's why babies kind of freak out when mom leaves the room. They know naturally they are dead. I mean, God gave them these voices and these pestering voices because they know they're dead if the big people forget about them for an extended period of time. They have to be able to get our attention again and again. Uh, so God expects his children to understand that we need him. Brothers, sisters, you need God spiritually. We're dead. We're dead without him. Secondly, uh, God expects his children to run to our Heavenly Father when we have fears and worries. And I shared with you a couple stories about my own children last week. But even uh, children that are starting to get independent, mature, and tough, when something scary happens, they want to run to dad because they think dad is strong. Dad is a place of safety, a, sh a place of shelter. And when life gets hard, where do we run? Well, there's a lot of things we can run to, you know, comfort, food, and those kind of things. Or we can run to our Heavenly Father. Three, uh, God expects his children to take comfort in him, to take joy in him. Our relationship with God is supposed to be a source of joy. It's kind of like being with the family at Thanksgiving or, or Christmas or just having a meal together. We're glad because we're together as a family. There should be a sense of peace that comes from hanging around our Heavenly Father. Have you ever noticed that when our spiritual life is kind of working the way it should? That we enjoy to be with God, with God's people, in God's family. That we gain our strength and our peace from being close to God. These are all things that spiritual children of God do. In each case, pride. Remember, pride is what the, what the apostles were struggling with in spades. Pride was not part of the equation. You don't need pride to understand you're helpless. In fact, it gets in the way, doesn't it? I'm a strong, independent person. I do it myself. No. We need to be reliant on God. Two, pride doesn't help you to get to know that you need to run to the safest place possible. Safest place in the universe is with God. Three, pride is the enemy of taking comfort and joy and peace in God's presence because we think, I don't need God to have comfort and joy and peace. Christ goes on to say, whoever then humbles himself as this child, he's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Religious people, we try to use religion to make ourselves feel self-righteous. We use religion so we can look down at other people. That's exactly what the apostles were doing. And God, and God said, wait a second, you guys are worried about being great religious people of faith? You're not even going to get into heaven until you become humble like this child and recognize your need, your dependence on me. I am the source of life. It's not about your greatness. It's about who's your daddy. Whoever then humbles himself as this child, this person is great in God's eyes. God looks at a humble person. He loves it. Humble people, we're not, uh, humble people, when we're doing it that way, guys, we're not going to be putting ourselves up here to look down at others. Humble people, are hard to offend. What did I just say? Humble people are? Hard to offend. When we're being humble, we're not full of critical, a critical nature. We're full of grace towards others. Humble people recognize their own debt, and so they're quick to forgive other people of their debt. God looks down from heaven and says, oh, you're learning to forgive? You're learning to be patient? You're not hard to, you're, 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 you're becoming difficult to offend? God looks down and says, all right, that's my kid. See that? And God takes pleasure in that. Whoever humbles himself like a child, he's great in the kingdom of heaven. 
And then Jesus puts the focus on the child and teaches that God is pleased with whoever welcomes children in his name. God says, you big deal guys that want an important place in society, when you serve a child, you don't get anything out of it. I love it when my people serve children. Serve people that can't pay you back. Love people that can't give you anything in return. But, and here's what we're saying, remember we're saying that how often churches want to sanitize Jesus because he's too rough around the edges. You know, we, we were reading in, uh, in our book this morning for Sunday School that uh, the author said, I wonder if Jesus hate, I wonder if the disciples hated it when Jesus said something like that, you have to hate your mother and your father to follow me. He says, you have to hate your mother is not a seeker friendly message. <laughs> I, I thought that was funny. Of course, what Jesus was saying is, by comparison, you have to love me so much more than anything else. I have to be the center. I have to be everything. Uh, and Jesus is telling us that instead of trying to be, look at me, I have faith, look at me, I have religion, look at me, that we're supposed to be loving and being concerned for everybody, the least of these little children. And Jesus uh, he says that people who drive children from God, Jesus says, you're going to have to deal with me, and you're not going to like it. Jesus doesn't use nice, cutesy language. He tells us, and, and this is in the context again, of people caring more about being big deals than about caring about God's will and, and loving other people. Jesus tells us that, you would rather be tied to a giant millstone, the kind that you used an animal to grind the flour. You'd be rather tied to a giant millstone and hurled into a deep sea than to deal with him if we cause children to disbelieve in God. If this is not scary, it's because you're not listening. Jesus is scary. He wants everybody to be in heaven. And if our self-righteousness, if our religion, if the way we're, if, if our indulging in sin, if whatever we're doing is causing people to say, well, I don't want any part of God. Jesus, Jesus is saying, it's better for you that to be hurled in the deepest ocean than to deal with me. God goes on to say, I don't want even one of these to perish. Not one of these little children. This attitude of how can I use religion to be important or to feel be like I'm better than other people, guess what? It, it drives people away from God. People don't want to go to, part, to a church because they don't want to be part of those self-righteous people. And people that grew up in a church see all the backbiting and the bitterness and the division in the church and the critical hard-headedness and say, oh, I don't want to be any part of that. And they grew up and they leave the church. And Jesus, God in flesh, God coming down from heaven, stands in our midst and says, if that's what you're about, you might as well tie a heavy stone around your neck and jump into the ocean because it's, that would be better than dealing when my, with me when my wrath comes down. Instead of building up ourselves, let's love people close to Jesus. That's the kind of thing we say amen about. Instead of using religion to build up ourselves, let's love people close to Jesus. Amen. amen. Jesus then goes on to get even less PC. I don't know how you get less PC at that point. But he finds a way because he's God. Uh, Jesus says things that are even more difficult. He says that if anything causes you to miss out on getting your faith right, no matter what it is, cut it out of your life. And again, in the context of Jesus responding to the spiritual arrogance of the disciples, whatever it is that's going to cause you to miss eternal life, cut it. Just cut it right out of your life. And then, in front of these men who are interested in fame and power, you know, this whole thing started, they're probably thinking, like, oh, we shouldn't even say anything to Jesus. Why? 
They, they thought that when they asked, how can we be great, that it was going to go better than this. It didn't go well. So in front of these men who are interested in fame and power, Jesus says, don't despise the little kids. Don't look down at the weak, the lowly, the unimportant, the, the people that society thinks are unimportant. Next, Jesus tells a story of one missing sheep. And again, in the context of religious people not caring as they should, We've got 99 sheep. Ha. There goes one. Oh, well, we're having a good time sitting around having a ba-ba party. I don't even know what a ba-ba party is. But Jesus said, you leave the 99, you go after the one, and when you get the one, you celebrate. Do we just enjoy our holy huddle of sheep, our little flock? Or do we have a passion to go grab another? And go grab another. And Jesus said, my heart is to grab some more. But we just want to enjoy being Christians together. And anyways, those sheep don't know how to act the right way. I think their ba has a little bit of an accent. Jesus says, you've got the wrong mindset. Go out. Get some more people and bring them in to the family. He says, I don't even want one little child to miss out on heaven. Matthew 18, 12 through 14. What do you think? If any man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, did he not leave the 99 sheep on the mountains and go in search of the one that is strain? If it turns out that he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 that have not gone astray. So it is not the will of the Father. So it is not the will of the Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Okay, he's the Father, he's God, he's in heaven, and he doesn't, it's not his will that anybody should perish and face eternal damnation. Brothers and sisters, is it our driving heart, is it our passion to go out and seek the lost sheep, those who are straying, and bring them back into the flock? Do we, do we rejoice when people surrender their hearts to Jesus Christ? Are we too busy with unimportant things and everything else is unimportant? While these guys are focused on what religion can do for them, Jesus is asking them to stop focusing on themselves and care about God's heart and care about lost souls and find your joy in seeing people brought into the fold. So one, be humble like a child. And two, care about children, care about others. People who can't, when you serve them, they can't pay you back. Uh, let's read the next few verses now in chapter 18. We'll finish up later, I don't know when, because uh, Christmas is coming. Uh, I'm gonna read the next few verses in chapter 18. And there are some very, very famous verses again here, but I think that uh, we're going to see them differently than maybe we have seen them before. So let's look at from 15 to 20 and, and see them in this context that we've been discussing. The, the apostles go, who's the greatest? And Jesus then answers that question. Uh, Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. If a brother or sister sins, if a brother or sister sins, go and point out the fault. Well, this is why people don't like religion, right? Nobody wants them to say, nobody wants somebody to come to say, listen, you're ruining your life with that alcohol. Listen, you're, 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 you're so focused on making money, you're missing out on the rest of life. Nobody likes somebody else to come and put their arm around them and say, no, 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 no. Your kids are crazy, and they're going to grow up and be very crazy. Nobody likes that. If a brother or sister sins, go and point out the fault just between the two of you. Well, see, right away we do away with gossip. Gossip, I don't even know strong enough words to explain what gossip is. Gossip is a horror. It's vile. It's wicked. We don't need to be talking about people behind their backs destroying them behind their backs. 
Listen to this. If a brother or sister sins, go and point out the fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you've won them over. And I imagine maybe Jesus smiled at that point. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Uh, oh, man, this person is oh, it's just horrible. You know what? I'm going to do this God's way. Brother, you know how every Sunday you take your keys and scratch my car? I, I know you don't think that's a big deal, but it kind of bothers me. And the guy says, oh, no, I wonder why I've been doing that. You are absolutely right. I want to pay for your, fix, get your car fixed, and, and I, I'm going to stop doing that. And then God says, hey, brother's doing it right. Seriously, when somebody hears something and the Holy Spirit causes with them to say, wait, 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 I've been way out of line. And that relationship is restored? God gives it the big thumbs up. God likes that. So before you cut this person down in front of other people, before you sit and pout, go, just the two of you, make it right. But, verse 16, if they're not going to listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. So get two or three witnesses, mature people, mature Christians, bring them with you. 17, if they still refuse to listen, you have to tell the church, tell the church leadership. And if they refuse to listen, <clears throat> even they refuse to listen to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. In other words, listen, don't have anything to do with them. Now, is anybody here, we just finished Thanksgiving, we're coming up on Christmas, these are kind of warm, fuzzy times. Is anybody here a little disappointed with Jesus? Or, no. You know, this stuff's in the Bible. But we try to have a Christianity that ignores this stuff. Why are we trying to silence Christ? I, uh, I actually read this and sometimes go, oh man, I wanted a perky message. What I really want is to be faithful to the text. If Jesus said it, I want to preach it, right? If they refuse to listen, this person's sin, they're not repenting, they're, they're getting hard about it, they're getting hard-headed about it. Jesus says, there comes a time, God looks down from heaven and says, there becomes a time when actually you have to kick somebody out of the church. Well, that's sad. I don't want to do that. That would make me feel miserable. So therefore, what? I'm going to ignore the Word of God? I'm going to <coughs> ignore the Bible? Truly, verse 18, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. This idea of binding and loosing is you take a criminal, and if you bind him, it means he's captured. If you loose him, that means he's innocent. You've, you've set him free. And it's a term, uh, we'll get to this in a little bit, but the, that it's a Jewish term that meant that the local leadership had the authority to determine how to interpret God's law for that congregation. So Jesus is saying, if they refuse, you're going to have to cut them loose, and heaven will support that decision. What you bind, what you loose, heaven's behind that. 19, and truly, again, I tell you, so he's saying, truly, now listen, I'm serious, that if any two of you agree on earth about anything you ask for it, it will be done by your Father in heaven. Now, usually, we read this verse in the context of new cars, right? Well, if we can just get two of us to agree on anything, God will give us anything we want. Do you see? Isn't this weird? 19 is in the context of church discipline. and It's in the context of getting two or three witnesses together. And God is saying, I know this is going to be hard if you have to ostracize somebody. But when you come together and you agree on this, 
Your Heavenly Father will back you on it. This is not about getting whatever you want. I thought verse 19 was about getting whatever, didn't you? Look at it in context. It's about church discipline. Again, if I tell, again, truly I tell you that if any two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done to you by your Father in heaven. For what two or three, again, this is witnesses, two or three witnesses come together in my name, I'm with those guys. I am with them. Jesus puts the topic of church discipline within the context of battling human egos, who is the greatest, and not doing anything that would cause children to reject Christ. And a church in disorder has caused countless people to walk. Churches that are like this have caused countless people to say, I want nothing to do with Christianity or the church. Because they see it and it says it's all fake, it's all a fraud. Maybe because we think we know better than Christ and we don't want to do church discipline. Right away we see that when Christ is discussing discipline, did you notice the idea is not to grind anyone down? What was the very first point in church discipline? Win their heart. Win their heart. It's all about winning people's heart. It's all about relationship. It's all about fellowship. If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you've won your brother. That's the goal. Let's win each other's hearts. When God, I'm having some trouble with this family at church. I'm having this trouble with this person. I don't, God, I don't even know if it's my fault or their fault. I'm going to go and make it right. And God, give me that person's heart. And Lord, help me to see my own sins so I can... You know, this attitude pleases God. And churches that are doing that work because they're doing it God's way. Things don't go the, always the easy way, though. So if that private meeting doesn't get a few mature, uh, doesn't work out, get a few mature believers to go with you and try again. If that still doesn't work, you contact the ecclesia, which is Greek for congregation. You know what that means, what Jesus was talking about? He was talking about synagogue. Synagogue. Synagogue was these Jewish meetings, uh, Jewish kind of like churches where they would get together. The synagogue leaders were not only in charge of teaching, they were the protectors of the community, they were like the cultural architects for the community, and they were to exercise uh, disciplinary measures in order to maintain community. And God gave this responsibility to the local church. The Bible background commentary puts it this way, binding and loosing, terms normally used for tying up or imp uh, imprisoning versus freeing and releasing provide a natural metaphor for condemning or acquitting in a court as terms regularly used for rabbis' legislative authority in interpreting scripture. They naturally could be applied to judicial situations as well. And so the rabbis, we, we, we approach the scripture, what's binding and loosing? Because we live in America. The Jewish people knew what binding and loosing meant. It means the local rabbi was in charge of discipline. The local rabbi, and Jesus says, and now my synagogue, my church, will have that authority. Uh, synagogues developed, you know, you don't see synagogues so much in the Old Testament. They developed after the destruction of King Solomon's temple during the time of the Babylonian captivity. There was no temple. There was no centralized place for worship for the Jewish people. They needed places to pray, to worship, and to hold their culture together. And so they got this idea of setting up local worship places called synagogues, and they appointed rabbis that would keep the community going, that would teach the people the Old Testament, and also keep the people in line. This is what God's will is. This is how we're supposed to live. Jesus is now designating his church with the same authority, this is, and this is the second time he did it. Remember when Peter says, you are the Christ, Jesus said, who am I? And he says, you're the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus says, on that rock, this truth, I'm going to build my church. Remember that? At that same time, with the birth of the church, he says, and I'm giving the authority to bind and loose to the church. This is the second time he's done it. In chapter 16, he said, Upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell are not going to overpower it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, this is an extraordinarily unpopular message for me to give. Uh, in the U.S., we are so individualistic, we don't naturally value community. We, we, we leave community in order to make two or three bucks an hour more, right? We move. We leave family. We leave churches uh, so we can get a bigger house uh, in another town or whatever. And we, we as Americans really, 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 really don't like the concept of 
submitting ourselves to, to God-ordained authority. But this is not the way the Jewish people saw it. When they heard it, that's not the way they saw it. That's not the way Christ taught. Uh, that's not the way Christ envisioned the church. Again, according to Bible background commentary, the local synagogue had the power. No, I'm, we're not going here. <laughs> they had the power to flog members. Flogging was considered the minor punishment. To ostracize somebody, to banish them from the congregation was considered the big punishment. And they had different levels of ostracization, like you can't be in the fellowship, but we can still meet together, or we can't even talk together, that kind. You know, there's different degrees. The Bible doesn't get into any of these details. Instead, God just says, I'm giving the keys to the leadership. And so we don't whip people, and there's a re good reason for that. There's no example ever of the early church whipping people. There's nothing in the church, uh, in the Bible, about the church whipping people. And God himself says, if you love me, walk with me. If you don't, you can walk. So guess what? When people don't want anything to do with Jesus, do we grab the whip? No. We say, we love you, brother. Hope you come back. There's nothing. That's, the synagogues were doing it wrong. And the church was never told to whip people. The church was said, if somebody is sinning and they're stubborn and they're unrepentant, there can be a time when you have to exclude them from fellowship. The kingdom of heaven is voluntary. If people don't want to be a part of what God is doing, we don't beat them. We don't kill them. You know, actually, that's a debate. Because uh, not among Christians, but Muslims often tell Christians, you're not doing it right. Uh, because you should kill, if you really believe the Bible, you would kill people that left Christianity. I think they don't understand the Bible. But anyways, uh, we let them go. And the Bible does talk about times Again, when the church has to expel people that actually want to stay. And isn't that sad? But for the sake of the church, they can't. So who gets the boot? Sinners! No. Uh, we're all sinners. <laughs> uh, there would be no pastors if we gave everybody the boot uh, who has sin. There would be no deacons, Aaron, because I heard you laughing when I was talking about pastors. Uh, <laughs> If we kicked out every deacon with sin, we wouldn't have any deacons. Uh, we wouldn't have a congregation. We would, <coughs> God would be sitting in this room by himself, and he would not be happy. He'd be lonely. Uh, the key here, the key, we saw it with each step. It's a person who won't repent. You say, brother, what you're doing is wrong. And they say, yeah, I know it. You don't kick that person out. What you're doing is wrong. I know. Help me change. You don't kick that person out person who says, are you cheating on your wife? Who are you to judge me? Are you selling drugs? Yeah, what do you care? That's the person. Why do you talk to your wife that way? Get out, get out of my face. I'll talk to you that way. The unrepentant person who will not humble themselves is the person that needs to be removed from the church. So who gets the boot? There's the, the key, again, is the people who are, are rejecting help, who won't repent, they can't admit they're wrong, people who ignore the church leadership. There's another element in, in this context of binding and loosing. Uh, everybody, our church leadership actually talks about this stuff. And guess what? How many people have we kicked out so far? Zero. And, and I'm 45. I'm really, really hoping I can make it to 90 and have kicked zero people out of church. Uh, there have been some times when I've had to come to people and say, do you understand what you're doing is wrong? And I thank God with tears, they say, yeah. So in the context of our church, we talk about what would it look like to have to kick somebody out because we want to be faithful to this. We don't want to just do something to build a big congregation. You know, we don't want to just do something to, to make people feel comfortable. In our church, we've looked at it this way. And I'm going to explain to you this process a little bit. We've discussed it, uh, not disgusted it, we, we've, dis we've talked about it. And uh, there's a difference, we feel, between a non-Christian or even a, a young Christian. And there's a difference between somebody who's maybe a long-time Christian, but they're in a place where they're just broken 
and they're distraught, and they're, they're in pain, and we want to be a hospital for them. And then somebody who's been in the church for years and is more mature in their faith and is outwardly, brazenly sinning, and they're not repenting. They're, they're joking about what they've been stealing from the company. No, no, you can't steal. Huh, the company's big. They don't care. Now listen, brother. You're going to lead other people to think theft is okay. You've got to repent of that. We cannot have that. We can't, you, you're seen as a leader in this church. We can't put our, our you know, stamp of approval on what you're doing. Well, I'm not a leader. People are watching you. You're influencing others. How about, there was, there was an instant, a big church down near Illinois, the worship team leader was sleeping around. It was a gal. They said, we have to remove you. She got so self-righteous. She started an internet campaign. I thought church was about grace. I said, no, no, no. You are leading us into worship. Not that you're sinner, not that you're perfect, but you won't repent of your sin. You won't say that you're wrong. You won't move, remove yourself from this situation. This can't be. Otherwise, the church falls apart. That church, by the way, did the right thing. You know, another church took her. They did the wrong thing because they wanted a, a big, famous worship leader. So in this idea of kicking people out, which we're talking about because Christ did, and it's very important, and I want you to all to understand the process, and I hope we never have to do it. In this context, we would ask as a leadership team several questions. Is this person still learning? Are they humble? Are they growing? Are they still learning? Would it be best for that person and the church if we continue to work with them within the church? Because there comes a point when a person is so stubborn that you say, boy, we love this person, and nothing we can do is helping them. Maybe if we stop befriending them, they'll hurt enough to want to come back and humble themselves. Or you can say, we love this person, but what they're doing, they're an example to our young people, they're an example to the young Christians. Can't have it. Can't have it. Or have we done all we can? Where can the leadership humble themselves and say, brother, I need to do more for you. Help me see how I can help you in this situation. Not quick to judge. Is this person stubborn or teachable? Are they starting to cause division in the church? Is this person respected? Do they have charisma? And if so, and if they continue to remain unrepentant in the church, would this encourage other people then to think, well, the church thinks that's no big deal for them to, to sleep around. Well, then it's okay for me. Well, the church thinks it's okay for them to do this, so then it's okay for me. And in the process, they not only destroy themselves, they destroy the ministry and our ability to save people from hell. And we've got to stay on focus. People up front are going to be held to a higher standard. It's just the way it is. Examples we've talked about in our group, again, are theft, adultery, drunkenness. In, in not a person who's drunken and they're saying, I really want to change, help me. But a person who said, huh, I got a party. This is my life. I'm doing it the way I want. Do you see the difference? There's two reasons given by Christ as to why a church would do something so painful and so unpopular. Because you don't win friends by talking about church discipline. That's not a church growth mechanism. People don't, don't uh, watch this kind of sermon on TV and say, boy, I really want to be a part of that church. Uh, number one is to win the person's heart back to Christ. The point is not to push them down and we're so righteous and we're going to make them feel. The point is we've got to win their heart back. So church discipline has to be with winning their heart. And secondly, if sin and rebellion is ignored in the church, it might destroy the church. And we have, we have got to be here to love people close to Jesus. <coughs> and if we're winking at sin, and there's horrible things that happen in this world, and we're saying it's no big deal, we will become ineffectual and powerless. Guys, everything we want to do is about bringing people close to Jesus, right? 
Let's stay humble. Christ died on the cross because sin is a big deal. Sin destroys everything good. Sin destroys love. Sin destroys peace. Sin destroys joy. Parent-child relationships, sin destroys it. Husbands and wives, sin destroys it. Church, sin will destroy it. Christ died on the cross because sin's a big deal. The modern church acts like it isn't. If sin was not a big deal, there would be no cross. Charles Spurgeon, the prince of preachers, great title, put it this way. It's an astounding thing and a great proof of human depravity that people don't seek salvation. People aren't breaking down the joys of church saying, I need to be saved. Somebody save me. Spurgeon goes on to say, they even deny the necessity of it and would sooner run, <laughs> run away from God than to be partakers of it. God says, I'll forgive you. Come on in. Everybody come on in. I love you. I'll forgive you. And people think of reasons why I don't need salvation. I don't need forgiven, forgiveness. I don't need God. would rather run away from God than to run to grace and forgiveness. It's the role of Christians in love to call people to repentance. And ultimately, the big question is, brothers and sisters, are we here at uh, Foundation Bible Church? Are we here in the church, good churches, Bible churches all over the world? Are we ultimately here to have fun, just to have fun, play at religion, are we here just to have potluck parties, cook brats, have a holy huddle? I like hanging around with other Christians. Or, or, or are we here just to have fun? Or do we really believe that we're on this great and grand mission, that we have purpose and meaning that we are here to snatch people right out of the flames of hell, to snatch them right out of the devil's hands, and, and, and to create this family, this movement of love and grace and peace and goodness and forgiveness. And we just want to do everything we can to grab more people and bring them in and bring them in. Are we here just to have fun? Or are we part of something big and beautiful and wonderful to snatch souls right out of hell? And do we really believe that if we're humble and obedient, that God can use our little church to change people's eternal destinies. Do you believe it? Then we've got to value the things God values. And he says, don't do anything that would cause people to reject me. It'd be better if you tied a millstone around your neck. God is serious about this. Because how we answer this big question of, of are we here just to have fun at church or are we here to save people, changes how we do church. If we're here just to have fun and eat potlucks, we're going to never do difficult things. We're never going to sacrifice beyond where we're comfortable with. We're never going to challenge people to surrender their lives more fully, to give more time, to give more money to further God's work through our church. We're never going to uh, execute church discipline in the hope that more people will repent and be restored and come to faith. Well, I'm done. Uh, I think, let's try to keep this in mind. Again, I really hope that I can go the rest of my life and never have to do church discipline. I hope that I'm humble enough to God to be willing to do something that would break my heart and probably take years off my life if I ever had to do it. But I hope I would do it with love and grace because I love God and the church enough to do what needs to be done. Um, this entire intense discussion of kicking unrepentant people out of the church, uh, you know what happens next? Chapter 18. Jesus is going to talk about forgiveness. Isn't that a beautiful way to tie it up? So listen, Jesus came to save sinners. Uh, for him, it's all about restoring a love relationship. Uh, Jesus came to die for our sins that we could be with him for eternity. We need to keep this in mind, that even when we see church discipline in the Bible, did you notice it's not about rules? It was still about the people. God's all about the people and loving people enough to know that sin can destroy them and sin can destroy our church. So let's do things God's way. Let's love each other. 
let's set aside bitterness and rage and anger and unforgiveness. Let's do things God's way, and let's love each other enough to keep calling each other back to repentance, back to repentance. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, everything here this morning was difficult. I thank you that you gave me a, a voice uh, to finish speaking this morning. Lord, uh, I don't want to argue with you. I just want to see it your way. So, Father, please uh, use your message to speak to us on a soul level. I pray that we're humble, Lord, that we're teachable. Father, whatever you have for, for our leadership, for our congregation, for our church, Lord, we are so lost without you. Please just show us, Lord. Lead us and guide us. And, uh, Father, we want to be more like you. And I pray that everything we do is based on love, Lord. pray this in your name. Amen. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.